Hi, I wanted to review some of the material from uh, this week, um, uh, the 3rd and 5th of September, and then also give a quick preview of a couple of topics for next week. Um, if you are especially interested in this preview of a couple of topics for next week and want to skip ahead, then I'll put the time right up here um, for, the, for when you should. It'll be toward the end of the video. Um, so first of all, um, on Tuesday we talked about um, multiple sclerosis and um, that this involves an immune attack where the immune system is attacking oligodendrocytes and that kills the oligodendrocytes and then also eventually, since the axons underneath get support and nutrition from the oligodendrocytes will cause the axons to die. Um, this will, um, it's diagnosed with an MRI, and we showed a, saw a picture of how in the central nervous system, it's brain or spinal cord, you're going to see um, uh, spots where there's damage because of the dying or dead oligodendrocytes and axons. Um, the symptoms can include a wide range of things, including cognitive and emotional changes if they're affecting different parts of the brain, as well as numbness or weakness if it's affecting sensory inputs or motor outputs, or because these axons fire action potentials as they're dying, you can get tingling or other sort of sensations when those random action potentials show up, or muscle twitches if the random action potentials show up on a motor axon. Um, we also talked about um, Guillain-Barre um, in general, um, and so Guillain-Barre is a um, is a, a disease that affects the peripheral nervous system, um, the the Schwann cells um, that um, uh, make up the the nervous the peripheral nervous system, um, and we talked about um, this uh, test that you can use to distinguish between them. Um, an MRI is the most uh, conclusive test. Also, MS is a lot more common than Guillain-Barre. Um, but reflexes involve a sensory input from the muscle being activated, and then that making a synaptic connection directly on a motor neuron, and then a motor neuron axon sending a signal back to the muscle to make that muscle contract. Um, the reflex, aside from a sort of like tiny bit of axon, in the, uh, in the central nervous system is basically all peripheral input and motor peripheral uh, output. There is a signal sent up to the brain, but that signal to the brain does not, um, is not involved in the muscle kick. The muscle, in other words, the, mu the muscle twitch happens before the brain even knows about it. So this reflex is just involved in the peripheral nervous system. As a result of that fact, um, when someone has Guillain-Barre, the reflex gets weaker because the sensory inputs are weaker and the motor outputs are weaker. The action potentials are less likely to reach. Um, in multiple sclerosis, however, it turns out that there's a bit more complexity, which is that the motor cortex doesn't just excite motor neurons. It does when you want to move, but when you're just relaxing, there's a little bit of inhibition. And what that means is that normally the kick that you give is a little weaker than it would ordinarily be, or than it would be if your brain was gone um, because your brain is putting a little bit of inhibition. Now the sensory input is so strong that you still give a kick, but that kick's a little bit weaker than it would have been if your motor cortex wasn't inhibiting your, your um, uh, motor neurons. And so what that means is that injuries that damage the connection from motor cortex to the motor neurons, first of all, present, prevent your motor cortex from letting you move when you want to, so you're either paralyzed or weak, depending on how bad the injury is, um, and also turn down this inhibition, which means that the reflex actually gets stronger. Um, and so you can distinguish between multiple sclerosis and Guillain-Barre syndrome with a simple reflex test. Um, if somebody has the same weakness and numbness, but they give a bigger kick, then that's multiple sclerosis because the inhibition is what's gone while well, they're just relaxed. Um, if they have Guillain-Barre syndrome, they're going to give a smaller kick. We also just talked in general about mixtures of excitation and inhibition toward the end of the class on the 3rd, and then spent a lot of time today on the 5th talking about excitation and inhibition. So first of all, with that, in the context of excitation, um, we began actually by talking about the steps in neurotransmitter release in general. Um, for now, you can we did talk about ATP and metabotropic receptors, but you can pretty much ignore that for unit one, um, for sure, at least until we get into ADHD. Um, but um, what you should remember is um, that when an action potential reaches a presynaptic terminal, 
There are voltage activated calcium channels that are there. Calcium flows in. It sticks to these bubbles that are filled with a whole bunch of neurotransmitter called vesicles and then makes that vesicle connect with the plasma membrane, with the cell membrane. And then what's inside the vesicle just spews out, diffuses out into the synapse and it sticks to postsynaptic receptors. The most common neurotransmitter in the brain is glutamate and this neurotransmitter will bind to glutamate activated sodium channels, also called ionotropic glutamate receptors, and let sodium flow in which is going to excite the neuron. This glutamate then gets sucked back out of the synapse and then will eventually get put back into a new vesicle so that you can have the signal happen again. So because these glutamate receptors are sodium permeable, that means that when an action potential happens in an excitatory presynaptic neuron, there's a little um, depolarization. The inside of the receiving cell, the postsynaptic cell, gets more positive, but Typically, that is not strong enough to get the neuron to threshold. But if that same presynaptic cell fires multiple action potentials, or maybe if multiple excitatory presynaptic uh, cells are all firing action potentials at the same time, then the cell will reach threshold, and you'll get a big depolarization. Um, we talked about, um, sort of listed, the steps in synaptic release. So the action potential arrives at the presynaptic terminal, voltage activated calcium channels open, calcium flows in, calcium sticks to the vesicles, the vesicles fuse, and then the neurotransmitter diffuses into the synapse. And then once the neurotransmitter is in the synapse, then it sticks to the neurotransmitter receptors. Our first example is glutamated activated sodium channels, also known as ionotropic glutamate receptors because they let ions flow through and they are receiving a glutamate signal. Um, or what we're mostly going to be talking about them as is just glutamate receptors because I and most neuroscientists are lazy, and that's what um, uh, glutamate does is it binds to receptors that let sodium flow in. Um, I mentioned, although we're not really going to dig into it until um, really unit two, um, G protein coupled receptors and also ATP. Um, that came up as a question, but for now, we're just going to kind of not have that be something that you're going to have to worry about for exams or quizzes or anything. Um, but um, uh, in a minute, we'll talk about GABA receptors. In any case, so the neurotransmitter sticks to the neurotransmitter receptors, and then after a millisecond or two, it kind of starts unsticking, and then it gets removed from the synapse by this glutamate transporter, way back over here that I drew in green. Um, and then the new vesicle is made in the presynaptic terminal and filled up with neurotransmitters so the signal can happen again. Um, in terms of the transporter, we talked about what happens if the transporter is blocked or broken. The glutamate can't recycle back, um, so that might eventually cause you to run out of signal. But before the, you run out of signal, you're going to actually have a stronger signal because that glutamate sticks around longer. And also that glutamate might diffuse out throughout into the whole brain and cause extra excitation of other neurons that are not supposed to be excited. Um, additionally... Um, we talked about GABA. The release of GABA is all the same, as is the reuptake and everything else. The only thing that's different about GABA is it's a different molecule, physical structure. Um, that was in the slides, although you don't need to know that, uh, at least not the details of it. Um, and then it's the receiving cell has an ionotropic GABA receptor, or just a GABA receptor, or a GABA-activated chloride channel, if you prefer, um, uh, although I'll be calling them just GABA receptors. And these GABA receptors let chloride flow through. Chloride is also at a high concentration out than in, but unlike sodium, it has a negative charge, so we're letting negative ions flow in. And that is causing the um, receiving cell to get hyperpolarized or inhibited, moving it further away from threshold. Um, and so we uh, here's a couple different images of that that are up on uh, up on they'll be up on Canvas. Um, so if we have just the inhibitory cell fires and action potential, our postsynaptic cell has a little hyperpolarization. An excite a single excitatory input will cause it to get closer to threshold but not fire. Multiple excitatory inputs will cause it to get um, to threshold and fire an action potential unless there's also some inhibition. And the inhibition can prevent an action potential if maybe it's like an inappropriate context or something else is going on where um, this there's some input saying that this cell maybe should fire, but then another cell says, wait, no, 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 don't fire. There's something else going on. We need to stop this signal. We then switched gears a little bit and talked about the motor neuron connection to muscle cells. 
Um, remember, from Tuesday, we talked about the uh, motor cortex and how it can either turn on or turn off this motor neuron. And while you're resting, mostly it's turning it off. But then, same kind of story generally, which is action potential in the motor neuron causes calcium to come into the presynaptic terminal. In this case, our neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to um, ionotropic sodium channels, um, uh, or ionotropic acetylcholine receptors, rather, which are also called acetylcholine-activated sodium channels, or just acetylcholine receptors. Again, everything has a bunch of names. Um, one difference about neuron-to-muscle connections is that the neuron-to-muscle connections are not one single synaptic connection, but rather like a hundred different connections all from this one motor neuron. So all, so a bunch of branches from this one motor neuron all connect to this single postsynaptic cell. And what that means is that there's a really strong connection so that when the motor neuron fires, for sure that postsynaptic muscle is going to fire an action potential. We discussed as well a couple different auto, a couple more autoimmune diseases, myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton syndrome. These are a little different from each other. Myasthenia gravis is a postsynaptic disease where the receiving acetylcholine receptors um, on the postsynaptic side of the muscle are being attacked and getting and destroyed. In Lambert-Eaton, it's the presynaptic voltage-activated calcium channels specifically at this neuron to muscle synapse that are being attacked. So that means less acetylcholine is being released. Both of them cause weakness, and unlike Guillain-Barre or multiple sclerosis, there are not sensory deficits with myasthenia gravis and lambert -Eaton. So that's one main way to distinguish these two from, for example, Guillain-Barre. Um, actually, there would be a decreased reflux in these. Um, looking ahead to some of the material for next week that will be also on the um, homework, um, one interesting feature of acetylcholine synapses that is different from other synapses is that acetylcholine synapses are designed to very quickly stop the signal. Um, we talked about how, for example, with glutamate and GABA, the removal of the neurotransmitter back into the presynaptic terminal takes somewhere around five milliseconds or so. Um, that is fine for most synapses, but it turns out it is too slow for neuron-to-muscle synapses. And so at neuron-to-muscle, but also all other acetylcholine synapses, there is an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that destroys the acetylcholine and breaks it into two parts, acetyl and choline, um, that turns off the signal super quickly um, in less than a millisecond, about 10 times faster um, than the removal process. There is a slower removal process where the, acetyl, the acetyl and choline are brought back into the presynaptic terminal and then stuck back together to make acetylcholine so that we can recycle. Um, but neuron, neuron to muscle synapses and all other acetylcholine synapses actually break down the acetylcholine even before it gets removed. That allows for faster um, uh, removal. Um, so that's one thing that we'll talk a little bit about at the beginning of class on Tuesday. And then what we're going to be talking about on Tuesday is talking about obsessive compulsive disorder. There are a number of different brain areas and so on that we're going to be talking about with obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, but one particular set of brain structures that we're going to be talking about is a structure called the basal ganglia. Um, the basal ganglia are quite complicated, and we're going to get into more detail about them when we talk about Parkinson's disease toward the end of class in the context of neurodegeneration. Um, but for now, what you need to know about the basal ganglia is that dopamine is a critical neurotransmitter in the basal ganglia. And the function of dopamine in the basal ganglia is to turn on the motor cortex. Um, there's a lot of excitation and inhibition going on here, but the overall function of dopamine is that it turns on motor cortex and creates an urge to start moving. Um, this is and, also, and this is related to um, compulsive behaviors in obsessive compulsive disorder and also to Tourette's syndrome. Um, and it turns out um, that that will be that um, there are dysfunctions in the basal ganglia and some of the connections between the cortex and the basal ganglia in obsessive compulsive disorder, which is something that will come up next week.